Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Uncorked with Funny Wine Girl. This is Funny Wine Girl, aka Janine Luby. And as you know, every week I always start off saying how I know my guest or how I was, you know, got introduced to them because it's my little uh, mini TED talk I like to give every week that I think it is so important that we are curious, that we are open and that we get to know people, uh, whether we're out there at a business mixer or we go to a sporting event or an arts event or supporting our local businesses. I think it's so important that we get to know people, introduce ourselves, learn about them, let them learn about you, exchange business cards, hold on to those cards. You never know how you're going to pop up into one another's lives and how you can help one another. I think that is so key. And I think we, we do much better together. Uh, we can accomplish a heck of a lot more. We're connected and we're out there working together. So the, my guest this week uh, is someone that I, I was able to connect with thanks to a previous guest and friend of mine, Jen Partika, who is uh, was a nurse. I knew her from North Scranton. We were two girls from the same hood. And she actually had me come and do laughter yoga a couple of years ago for her morning uh, uh, staff meetings for her nurses that she was in charge of. Uh, I believe it was the uh, the trauma unit, I believe is what it was. And that might not be the right name, but it was, let me tell you, 6 a.m. was pretty darn early for me to be laughing. 6 a.m. and 9 a.m., but they were crazy hours, I know. And the idea was to lift their spirits because we know that, you know, uh, healthcare providers are under a lot of strain and stress. Jen was uh, a guest on the podcast. I don't remember the exact date because everything melds into one another, but not that long ago. She is a staunch Democrat here in Lackawanna County, and we were talking about uh, nurse rights, uh, and she's a nurse advocate because, as she says, nurse advocacy is patient advocacy, and she talked all about that, but she also helped me to get Keir Bradford Gray on here uh, several months ago, to, who was on the ballot for uh, state attorney general here in Pennsylvania. Unfortunately, she did not get uh, to represent us Democrats, but she is a kick butt woman, and I hope we get to hear from her again. And here is another kick butt woman who is in office that is my guest this week. So it is a Democrat representative uh, in the House of Pennsylvania, uh, excuse me, Pennsylvania House of Representatives, the 114th district for anyone who wants to look that up. It is Bridget Malloy Kazarowski. Welcome, Bridget, after that mouthful that I just did. <laughs> uh, well, well, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today with you. Um, thank you for that kind introduction um, and to just touch on your previous guest who uh, suggested I be a guest. Jen and I are dear friends. We went to high school together. Um, we, you know, she's a nurse here in, in Lackawanna County and a trauma and recovery room nurse. And um, that's so great that she had you come and just kind of start the day off with the nurses because uh, healthcare workers are essential and sometimes they need to take a little time for themselves. They take care of everybody else. So for her to be that um, uh, thoughtful of her staff and be able to have you come on in and, and get the day started with a little um, namaste is a good thing. So uh, thank you for doing that. That's great. And yes, those hours are crazy ridiculous because it's kind of dark at 545 in the morning when you got to go over to the CMC hospital. So yes, I, um, I, that's a very sweet thing that you're able to do. Yeah, Jen is awesome. She is clearly is someone who uh, I, I always get confused with that expression. If you talk the walk, walk the talk, whatever it is, she does what she says, basically. And she is a real good advocate uh, for nurses, for healthcare, for yes. individuals. Um, and we'll get into I want to get into a little bit later. Your background is in nursing. But first, if you don't mind sharing a little bit about yourself, and I want to uh, talk to you about your role in politics, and then we'll we'll pull in how important uh, your experience is in nursing and how that uh, can help with basically protecting women's rights in healthcare. But let's learn a little bit about sure. you, if you don't mind. So a little background um, about me. I uh, my name is Bridget Malloy Kazarowski. Um, I grew up in Clark Summit, Pennsylvania. Um, my mom and dad, uh, Eddie and Rosie Malloy. My mom grew up in Southside on River Street in South Scranton, and my dad's from Dunmore. Um, and, uh, you know, my dad and I moved down to Philadelphia when I was a new baby. He trained as a, he's an orthopedic doctor, um, and he worked in Scranton area for 40 years. And my mom, um, took care of all of us. So I'm the oldest of six. There's five girls and, and the youngest is a boy. We call him the boy. Um, <laughs> yes, the boy. Uh, so I grew up in Clark Summit. I went to a little grade school, Our Lady of Peace school up in Clark Summit. And then, uh, Jen and I, like your, your, your previous guests, we, uh, I went off to Scranton prep. And I graduated from Scranton Prep in 1990. Um, and I went off to Villanova to nursing school. Um, and I graduated from Villanova Nursing School. 
and I went to uh, to work in Philadelphia, the University of Pennsylvania Hospital, and I worked there for about 10 years. I worked in the recovery room there, and I always tease people because, um, you know, I went to Villanova Nursing School, which is an amazing institution, a beautiful college campus, a beautiful school, but when I got down to the University of Pennsylvania, um, I was, you know, hired on the floor, the floor nursing, which is, I, I encourage all people that graduate from nursing school, whether you go on to be a nurse anesthesia, pharmaceutical rep, nurse practitioner, I think all nurses should work on the floor for one year. I think it is essential that you get those skill set and you really connect with people. And um, it's a wonderful way to, to, to uh, you know, hone your skills, your basic nursing skills. So I was really um, grateful for my preceptor. You know, I got a wonderful preceptor. She uh, was, she really taught me everything I needed to know about nursing. Her name was Diane. Um, and, you know, back then I had her for almost four months. I mean, our priests, our nurses now are getting thrown out of nursing school on the floor. They're kind of getting a quick orientation because we have such an incredible shortage that they're kind of thrown out there with an assignment. And, you know, it's, it's a lot for them. And that's why that burnout level is so high. So I worked at University of Pennsylvania for, for a couple of years. And then my husband graduated. He finished law school and we had our first baby, Jake. And um, I was like, we have to leave immediately. I need my mother. We have to go home. We have to go back to Scranton. I need help. So um, we moved back home to Scranton in 2002. Um, and we've lived up in, I live up in Clark Summit now. And um, Joe and I have four kids. We have Jake is our oldest, then Maggie, and then Anna, and then Noah. So we have four kids. And um, I got a job at uh, the North, it was called the Northeast Surgery Center. It was an outpatient, remember where Toys R Us was and yep. the McDonald's up in Dixon City? It was an outpatient surgery center and it was owned by physicians. And it was the best place to work because there was such a pride in the, in the facility itself because it was owned by doctors. Um, the staff was really valued. We um, were local, you know, we, a lot of people that I work with grew up in in, in the Scranton area. So we knew a lot of the patients. We knew a lot of the docs. It was a really kind of a mom and pop shop of employees and employers. Um, we all felt respected. We had Christmas parties. They gave us bonuses. Um, it was a really wonderful place to work. And I worked there for 18 years. Um, it was, I, I loved it there. I, I really loved my taking care of patients. I, uh, when I was at Philadelphia at Penn, um, I ended up working in the recovery room. So after patients would come out of the operating room, they'd end up over in the recovery room. And it was like a running joke because every time there was a patient at the university in Philadelphia that had an address from Scranton or Dunmore or Clark Summit, everybody would like, go get Bridget because take her over here because somehow they're going to know each other. And then I would go through like, okay, who's your family? What's your maiden name? Where'd you go to school? And there was always, but you know what? Then I would go out to the waiting room and I would talk to the family and say, my name's Bridget. I actually am from Scranton. I'm taking care of your loved one back here. Everything's good. Because when you're in a big teaching hospital and it's foreign to you and you're from a place like we grew up in in Lackawanna County, um, it's, it's, it made a big difference. And I knew that um, after I left that place, I, I got lots of um, people that had told me, oh, you know, I remember you, you were our nurse. You took care of my family and you came out and talked to us. So that made me feel good about being able to, to, to do that. So um, move back up to Scranton. 2019, I had a um, a uh, representative named, and you, you may remember him because he was kind of like a legend guy in Scranton. His name was Sid Kavulich. And Sid Kavulich was on the news, remember? Yes. I knew, I actually knew Sid, not real well personally, but personally, because we actually performed uh, comedy improv together yes, at the yes. comedy dojo. So I got to know Sid there. He was a wonderful guy. He was wonderful a, man, yeah. a marvelous human being. And you're, you know, you knowing him that way, people knew him because high school sports is such a great thing for us to watch at home. And he was on the news and then he took a job as the state representative and he was elected as state representative. And he um, unfortunately had just, you know, went in for a procedure, you know, at the university of Pennsylvania where I used to work and he went into it for a procedure and it was a cardiac procedure and he developed some complications and he did not, um, he didn't make it. So he passed and it was really, it was a blow to their community because he was so well loved and such a great guy. And, um, that was in 2018. And if you kind of, you know, put the timing together, 2016 was when women were really starting to um, be asked or encouraged to step up, to serve in government, go for a school board, go for your local county commissioner, try to get on your city council. You know, there was a lot of trauma people had experienced from Hillary Clinton's loss. And, and people were really excited for, you know, to have been supportive of the first woman who potentially could have been our president. 
And um, so there was a wave of, you know, just a lot of women that kind of, you know, wanted to serve and had stepped up. And there was a program at the University of Scranton. It was called Ready to Run. And it was a program that was just uh, um, informational, whether you wanted to be, you know, somebody that was a volunteer, knock on doors, or actually a candidate. Um, you know, it's a had- great program. I got to actually go with Julia Munley. Yeah, she yeah. Me, uh, she took me as her guest years ago, just because, uh, you know, just for me to be informed. She's a great friend that way. Yeah. And she's a big advocate for, for you know, women information. And, you know, because believe me, Janine, this is completely not in the books for me. I'm, I have four kids. I'm a nurse. I am. I have no political background. I did not grow, in a, grow up in a political family. I did not study government in college. I, um, you know, I, I, I didn't serve on school boards. I, you know, did the cafeteria school lunch, <laughs> but I didn't have policy, politics in my family. And now, um, you know, so anyway, Sid had passed away. The seat had opened up. It's called a special election. So it's not the typical election you have in November. It's called a special. So the, they, you know, pick a candidate, the Democrats and the Republicans pick a candidate. Um, they, these are the only two people that are, people are voting on in their, in their community. And you know how hard it is to remind people to get out and vote for November, like a big election. Yes. So can you imagine February in Scranton, it's <laughs> freezing cold and I'm, you know, they don't know who I, you know, it's, it had to get name recognition, the districts, just to remind you, these districts are run, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, house of representative district. I have district number one, one, four, there's 203 of us in the, in the house of representatives in Pennsylvania. There are 50 state senators. So my district is the 114th, which encompasses, I'm in Lackawanna County. So I've got like all of the Abingtons. And then I've got Green Ridge, South Side, or excuse me, Green Ridge, North Scranton, West Side, Dixon City, Scott Township. So it's kind of, you know, this this little um, C kind of shape of a, of a district. Um, so I, you know, we serve, I serve in Lackawanna County with other representatives and, you um, so long story, I, I was I got elected. I was the first female to be elected in Lackawanna County since Julia Munley's grandmother. She was the first woman to represent Lackawanna County. Um, like her, her grandmother, her grandfather passed away. He was a state representative, and her grandmother Marion took the position, and uh, she was the last woman to serve as in the House of Representatives um, as for, to, to rep, a woman to represent Lackawanna County, a Democratic mm-hmm. woman to represent Lackawanna County. So. Um, that was my claim to fame though, when I got, when I got, um, elected in 2019. So here I am in beautiful, um, Harrisburg in the state capital, And, uh, it was baptism by fire. I can only imagine. So, so you said a lot there. Um, so I didn't know that about Julia's grandmother, by the way. Uh-huh. So that's interesting. Uh-huh. Uh, I know that whole family is, is wonderful and really does care about, you know, people's rights and, and fighting for people. And, uh, what you said though, about 2016, I just want to go back for a minute. Like that was a major loss. Like I, I'm still like, I was one of those like really big time Hillary fans. And, uh, I have to say I, it was a blow. Uh, it really was a blow and it was yeah. really, uh, what I want to, you know, transition into here is this, um, this idea of getting women elected again, much like in society, we face, I believe different criteria, uh, like someone might pull apart and say, oh, well, Bridget, you don't have, you know, politics in your background, but look, look what got elected in 2016. You know what I mean? Like, so yeah. for men, it's a little bit different. I think sometimes where their experience is a little bit Uh, We don't expect this much, or at least society hasn't. So uh, it's just different rules, which is really unfortunate. But that was a big time loss. And I'm glad that you say that it did. There was this kind of synergy or energy for for women, like, let's get involved because we need to have seats at the table. We need to have our voices heard. Uh, so how was the experience for you since you, like you jumped right, like you said, you jumped in and, and you've had to learn so much, I'm sure on the job. Yes, and you're you're right. I, I, you know, a lot of times I think uh, for women, we um, kind of have to get, you know, ask permission, talk to our friends. Should we do this? Whereas men tend to just do it. They don't seem. To, and a lot of times I think women are the leaders in their um, their families. You know, if they have a loved one, they take care of parents, children, whatever. They tend to steer the ship. So it's a big sacrifice because you know, if you're going to run for office and you're going to do something like this, you, you, that's that invisible load I always talk about. Like you know, can you do this? Because you've got to do a lot of other stuff. Whereas I sometimes, you know, there's wonderful men that I work with and I have wonderful men in my life, my father, my husband, my brother, my uncles, my, but they, they, they operate differently. (laughs) They operate differently. So, um, and I think that that was a big barrier for me. Like, you know, 
I'm so glad I did. And I'm so glad I get to talk to other women that should um, consider and, and try to do this because we bring a different perspective to this um, state government. You know, there's lots of, um, there's lots of things in the, in the local governments that affect our everyday life. And I did not, I, listen, until I got here and, and I really f figured out what the House of Representatives do, what the state legislator does, how they affect our everyday lives, how I can help my community um, in, in really different ways, um, it's, it was baptism by fire. And I had some great people that really kind of, you know, just got me, got me uh, along everything from where in the hell is my parking spot in this Capitol? I, I can't even get in this building because I came in by myself. So I didn't have like an orientation with a new class. So, um, you know, it was, it was, it was a lot to learn, but this is a, um, a position that I'm really grateful because I get to be elected to serve, um, you know, my, my constituents. I have state senators have about 260,000 people that they represent. Um, excuse me, 160. I have about 65,000 people that I represent. Um, and I have really good staff that I get to work with in my district office, which is in Dixon City, and then here in my office in Harrisburg. Um, so, you know, I, I it's, you know, the, the committees that I serve on, being a woman and being a nurse was a very unique combination here in the house. There were no medical professionals here uh, amongst the 203. There was one, the one uh, gentleman that was the leader of the Republican party. He is a respiratory therapist. So when COVID hit, it was a it was a, a total storm because you know people we were traumatized. There was a pandemic. People had no idea who to believe, what to believe, what. So I felt like I was a, a resource of um, you know pragmatic resource for people to uh, rely on. Governor Wolf was our governor at the time, and he put me on the vaccine tax task force which was really a way to another baptism by fire because now I'm over in the governor's staff and the governor's office. And, you know, this was, this was, they were having press conferences and the department of health and there was lots to navigate and lots of um, obviously look back and we all will, we all look back on that and think what could have been done diff differently um, learning experience, but most importantly, it was taking care of our, our, um, our elderly, those with comorbidities and that vaccine was so crucial for people to not get sick. Um, and not end up in the emergency rooms and not tax our, our healthcare workers. And I think that combination, nurse, woman, healthcare worker, my colleagues, my peers, that I knew what they were doing every day in those in those healthcare settings, because they didn't, they couldn't stay home. Yeah. So yeah, that's I mean, wow, what it what a unique perspective, as you said, that you were able to bring and and can continue to bring. Um, before we explore that more, I want to take a moment because I think I said to you before I hit the record button, I am okay with with stating my ignorance and things. So I don't fully understand what's like, so what is it your responsibilities? And and I like the fact that you mentioned because I've had this mentioned before by Keir Bradford Gray when she was on here and other people that just how important local elections are because we're voting on the things that really do impact our lives and a lot of times as you had mentioned we don't even probably know to what degree so if you don't mind sharing just a little bit of an, a snapshot of what it is that someone in your position does so we understand why we need to vote the way like our values and what we believe in mm -hmm. sure and i think that that's the the most important like all government all politics they come back is local it's it, that statement is very true um, because it affects everything from our, you know, our, our roads, our bridges, you know, uh, uh, operations at, and, and PennDOT, operations in, um, you know, uh, hunting and fishing. Um, you know, we're p passing a bill now about sun Hyundai, uh, Sunday hunting and the times that you can. And, you know, we have a robust community of those that hunt in our community. Um, so, you know, those kind of things I, I, um, I did not pay such attention to because I, most of us are so busy and we're running around and we have our own lives and we're working on things. It's hard to, it's hard to step back and really peel through, okay, what is it? What's the county commissioner's role and then what's the mayor's role and then what's the state representative's role and then what's the state senator's role and then you have the whole federal government so you know really the biggest thing that i get to do and and our senator here in um that i serve under is senator marty flint so we he and i work really well together because we have you know the same goals in terms of funding uh projects and and things that you know we live in it's granted every time you turn around you, you there's something that is um, we have really good, uh, wonderful people in the community. They're trying to lift up the, the, you know, the, the side streets and the buildings and the, you know, we have builders here that are just 
I, I drive down Penn Avenue now in Scranton and some of the blocks on Lackawanna Avenue and over in um, uh, in Green Ridge area. Like there's so many cool businesses and small businesses that are just really thriving, but they need help. And I think that we can do that in terms of lots of the um, applications and the grants that come in to the, to the state because the taxpayers uh, monies can come back into the communities, but we need to advocate for that. Like Marty, myself, my other colleagues, you know, we get lots of applications for different projects that need to be supported um, but from the state and from uh, monies that we can bring back to the community. So that's a big, big part of what I, I can do. But there's also, like I said, um, somebody's house has got a problem with PennDOT, water is coming down off the road, um, you know, license, the licensures, the scope of practice, um, th things that affect that, you know, I have I, I have hairdressers and barbers that want to be able to change the law in Pennsylvania because of just being able to rent out their chair in their shops. We don't, you know, some other states have different laws than, than we do. So, you know, it's it's the constituent coming to me and telling me, hey, I want to I want you to pay attention to something and I need your help because 90 percent of the time I I need them to come to me and talk to me about it. And, you know, we hear about the word lobbyists. You know, people think lobbyists sometimes. Well, there's. They are, they are wonderful, wonderful resources of information for me because a commute, like a um, an advocate will hire a lobbyist because when they need to get all of us, the attention of the 253 of us, the Senate and the, and the House to advocate for a certain cause. And I, you know, I, I get a lot of the healthcare, um, uh, uh, long-term care ratio in hospitals, all, all of that. The lobbyists really do break it down for me. What, what does, what do we need to do Who's against it? Who's for it? And what are the what are the roadblocks I'm going to come through? And how do we write this legislation? And they're wonderful people to be able to help in that in that sense. Yeah, well, that and that's that is helpful explaining what it is. And it's interesting you talk about the funding and what you get to approve or whatever. I uh, one of the things that's uh, really on my mind these days. I, I get I try to stay positive, and, and you know, Facebook can get really dark. <laughs> Yeah. And like a lot of times, you know, some positive things will come through about something that gets funded and granted and different things in the arts. And I'm a big fan of the arts. Uh, but like, you know, you'll see all these comments, fix the roads, fix the roads. That is like a constant thing. I think that's why I said it because every day I'm like, oh, my Lord. But but, you know, the arts, I, I just this morning I was in Scranton before I drove down here to um, to Harrisburg and I attended the uh the, the wake funeral of my ballet instructor. Her name was Cassandra Devine and she had the, the, the Waverly School of Dance. It was at the community house. And, you know, that woman had a 40, 50 year tradition of just, but highlighting the arts in terms of all of our recitals, we needed musicians. We needed those that could do all of the artwork behind whatever the theme was at Disney or wasn't it. So we, it, she highlighted all of these after school programs where kids learned to, you know, use their skill set, which may, sometimes they didn't get in, in school. And it was music and it was art. And it was so anytime. And I don't know if anybody knows this. His gentleman's name is Tom Welby, and he's my chief of staff. And he is a huge advocate for the, the arts in Scranton. So when I tell you that my staff and the people I work with are a, the only reason I'm, I'm in anywhere, shape or form success, it, because they, I need them to, you know, to do the research, talk to me about this. We go out to places, we meet all of the um, people that support these facilities, um, you know, so, and they need help. And sometimes the only way I can help them is to, to get funding. Yeah. And that is so important. I think uh, Tom Welby, I think he was also in media for a while, if I'm not yes, mistaken. Yes. Right. Yes. I remember his name. Yes, and that him, voice. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. W yeah. Um, so let's talk about uh, real quick before we get into I want to talk about the upcoming big election and women's uh, rights, especially health care. Uh, what you said you are on the ballot. Right. But you're unopposed. So just for those of us who don't fully understand, what does that mean? Can you like, you know, do you need people to still obviously they're going to vote? I mean, if they're going to vote, let's say all Democrat, whatever, you'll be on there. But mm -hmm. do you because you're unopposed, how does that work exactly? Do you get to just like go right into office or what's the process? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it would be very nice if I would like people to vote for me, even though I don't have, you know, when you go get the ballot and it got your choices this year, I'm very fortunate. There's no one there's I don't have a Republican. Republican running against me. And that sometimes is because um, this is the first time I, I have to run every two years. So this is the first time I, I do not have an opponent. And um, sometimes it's because the Republican may look at the, you know, the money they have to spend. The uh, registration in my district is higher Democrat than Republican. Um, and they might be, it might not for them, they might say, you know, I'm not going to, I don't want to put my time and energy into this or my money because I don't think I could beat he or she. 
So um, I am very fortunate that whoever was out there looking to see if they wanted to run against me did their research and said, you know what, uh, she's done a good job so far. I get a lot of bipartisan support. I am I am a, um, a blue dog. As you, you know, what, if you want to call me a blue dog Democrat, that's kind of that's kind of what I, I I work on both sides of the aisle. So if you look at my voting record, there's lots of things that I support with bipartisan. Um, you know, and I think that's the only way. Keep in mind, I'm in the majority here in Harrisburg, but I'm only in the majority by one member. So we have the Democrats have only one more member than the Republicans. So it is it's the only way you will do anything is to to work across the aisle, compromise. And there is a smaller, 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 smaller section of us that behave that way because on both sides of the aisles, there's complete wing nuts that, uh, you know, that, 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 you can't, it just can't behave like that. You can't go at something like that because it's not gonna work. And I think, you know, when you, that big word compromise and talking to each other is so important. I think we've gotten away from that in a really ugly way. And it makes me, you know, keep, you know, I'm 53 years old. So maybe, you know, I'm older, I'm an older um, uh, member of the, of the, uh, the, the, and plus keep, and I also worked outside of this place for 28 years before I came here. So I do remember what it was like to have my own, I had to get our own insurance, my health insurance, because my husband was self employed and I had a child with a pre existing condition. He had leukemia. So I had a, a, a kid with, you know, childhood cancer. So when I went to get insurance, you know, it was, and I thought, I said to my husband, if you and I can't afford this and I'm a nurse and you're a lawyer, who, who they're, mm. they're, they're pricing everybody out. How, how is this possible? Which was kind of the, some of the reasons that I kind of got the fire in my belly to run. But I think that that's something that gives me that perspective when I come here to work, because I worked outside these walls in private world for 28 years before I came here. Yeah, I think that's important. So before I move on to the next uh, question, I want to ask, I, I hope, I assume your child is okay? Well, or, we're, we're, yeah. we're hugely, hugely grateful. He's uh, 23 years old. He just graduated from Villanova. He had leukemia and he was four. But because of research, you know, those St. Jude commercials and research, mm. research, research, childhood leukemia is curable. Childhood, other childhood cancer diagnoses are not so great. But childhood leukemia is curable because of research, because of those and I was, I call them the lab rats. I never got to see those people down in the basement that do all the research in those labs. I never saw them. I saw my oncologists, but I am eternally grateful for the, the research that they were able to, and the, and the children that died before Jake, the ones that went before Jacob that did not survive leukemia, but their parents, their loved ones gave their, you know, samples of tissue or spinal tissue or blood so that my kid, when he was diagnosed in 2007, my kid had a treatment plan because of those kids that did not survive leukemia 10, 15 years before. So anybody that talks to me about, re I will, I am pounding on the governor's door every freaking week for more money for pediatric and cancer research, because we can beat it, but we got to fund the research programs. Yeah. Well, and that's got to be difficult. I'm going to play a little bit of devil's advocate because <laughs> you have personal experience with that, obviously. So that's especially, you know, um, important to you, but there are so many things we need money for, right? So many things we need. I mean, there's so many different kinds of cancer. There's so mm -hmm. many, you know, uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, uh, for the elderly. I, I personally feel that we kind of don't do enough for the elderly in this country and kind of write them off, unfortunately, but there's so many things that's got to be yep. difficult in a position where you can make a change but you, first you have people disagreeing with you, arguing with you, and then how to prioritize. That's got to be a little bit uh, daunting, I would think, in your role. Yeah. Well, just real quick, I want to tell you, we have the most awesome secretary of aging. His name is Jason Kavulich. He's a Scranton native. He was the uh, uh, took care of the uh, AAAs in, in Pennsylvania. He is a huge advocate because we have the a, a very aging population here in Pennsylvania. And we have gotten away from... Other cultures tend to, I think, house their elderly as they age. They bring them in. They take care of them. The whole family. It's that, you know, it takes a village to raise the baby. Well, it takes a village sometimes to have the loved one that's elderly age with dignity. Um, and I know that there's lots of stressors because people work more than they did 50 years ago. You know, that's a two-parent working home. Um, and it's super expensive. And we don't have enough direct care workers. Direct care because people that age in home, age longer, healthier, and happier. Sometimes it's to no fault of anybody in the fit that they have to put a, a loved one in, an, in a, a long-term care center, but, but they tend to age rapidly there because the setting is different. 
And those that have early set dementia or Alzheimer's, sometimes it, it increases the rap, rapid um, rate of the disease because they're out of their environment. They, you know, they, they're agitated and we don't have enough direct care workers in long-term care centers and we don't pay them enough. So we are on a pathway, hopefully the Governor Shapiro with Secretary um, Kavulich and this new budget, because we got to do better because we are all aging here longer, and but we, we're not going to do it well. And we're going to hit a wall of total crisis if we don't do better at what you just highlighted, Janine. Yeah, it's just, it's sad because I, I, I personally, I mean, I don't have children. I'm also 53 and I like, I, I joke that I'll just say, I just kicked me into the river. They're like, want to just roll my body in because I don't know who the hell's going to take care of me. But, but I see some of these homes and I mean, I live right next door to my parents yeah. here in North Scranton. So I'm here for them, but I see, you know, 87 and 79 and, you know, and you see the different nursing homes and the different, like, I do worry about the future because yeah we don't have enough uh, uh, healthcare workers. And I just feel that even the way like ageism with getting jobs, people at a certain age over 40 or 50, yeah. it's almost like it's acceptable in our country to be ageist. And um, I, I, that's a big, you know, that's not something I'm saying you guys can do anything about, but I mean, culturally, I think we do need to change that because I think so too. Yeah, I think so too. And you're lucky you have you both your mom and dad, you know, near you and, and they have you close because, but like, you know, sometimes you can't, sometimes they can't be safe in their own home. So to know, not because you don't love them or because, you, but sometimes the family can't because the home isn't, you know, adapted to wider doorways of, of the uh, wheelchairs or no zero entry bathrooms or all the things that are needed. So it's such a crisis. It's such a crisis and it's so stressful for families and, and people to, to have to do it or they, they work and they don't have anybody from that, um, like that morning to evening time to watch. Cause you know, I always say it's really easy to get babysitters and somebody to change a diaper and feed a baby and put the baby in the bath and all that kind of stuff. But when you have to do that with somebody that's combative and elderly and, you know, has, has, you know, is sundowning and has dementia or Alzheimer's, it's really, it takes a special kind of caregiver mm -hmm. to do it. And it's very challenging. And guess what? Sometimes it's not the, the, the child. Like you, like uh, we're still children because my parents are still, so I'm still, but it would be really difficult to, for me to have to do those kind of things for my, you know, even if they needed it, it's hard. It's really hard. Even though I'm a nurse, it's still hard to do it for your own parent. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it certainly is something that it affects you in a way. And I mean, even to watch, you know, your parents getting it, it's challenging and I'm blessed right now that they're good, but like, I actually do one of those things that you, you know, when you're laying in bed, worrying about stuff, that's the one thing that pops up about their aging. You know? Yeah, of course. I know. So we're trying to do better here and we do have a good partnership with, with, uh, uh, Jason Kavulich. I give him a little shout out because he's wonderful. Yeah. I've seen his name on many things. So that's he's a good. good guy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about this election coming up and what's at stake, uh, which is, I mean, for me, it blows my mind when we're like, holy crap, you know, the handmaid's tale, could it become, ha you know, real, like where the hell are we when it's like, I think of that Virginia Slims ad, we've come a long way, baby. It's like, but have we, <laughs> you know, how, how sad, like it, it, to go back to what we talked about before, the fact that we can't uh, still can't elect a woman president in our country. There are many other countries who have had female leaders sure. to me is shocking, sad, disturbing, disgusting. So many words that come to mind because it's like the greatest nation, but why can't we do that? Of course I have thoughts on that. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> why men don't want a man female leader. That's their problem, but <laughs> uh, we need to get past that. Um, but let's talk yeah. about at what's at stake with women's health care in, in this election. And you as a nurse, let's talk about dispelling some of the nonsense that's out there that that babies are basically being killed. And that's abortion. That's like after they're born. That's not happening. No, um, two things. One, I do tease the guys that I work with. I said, you you guys have had a long 2,500 year long, long run. Like it's time for some of us to be able to. And listen, there there are wonderful, capable women that are more than ready. Um, but you're right. There's still this barrier that uh, I'd like everything about her. She's smart. She's this, she's this, but I don't, I don't know if we're ready. It's absurd and it's nonsense, but um, to get to the point of the election and to the point of, you know, what's at stake. And we hear, you know, democracy is on the line. You hear that your rights, women's health rights are on the line. And, you know, I don't want to be an alarmist or dramatic, but it is so frightening to me that we cannot rely on our healthcare professionals. My physicians that are trained in emergency room medicine and OBGYN medicine who know exactly what a treatment is for something like an ectopic pregnancy, something like a hemorrhage, something like a uh, sepsis. 
you know, to not be able to have our physicians and our, our trained medical professionals be able to, to treat the patient with the oath they have taken without stepping back for a moment and saying, you know what, I gotta call my, I gotta call our lawyer. I gotta call my state legislator because I gotta make sure that we are able to do this by law because um, there's nowhere, there's no room. Listen, when I'm in a doctor's appointment with my physician, the 203 people I serve with should not be in that room. <laughs> they should not be in there. They have no right to be in that room with me. It's be, and it, you know, listen, it depends on lots of things, but I grew up as an Irish Catholic kid in Scranton, Pennsylvania. We didn't talk about abortion. We didn't talk about, but I think I tell my girls, we didn't talk, I didn't talk to you about, my mom didn't talk to us about access to abortion because I truly believe she knew that it was available to us and to our choice if we needed to make that choice. And as women, we are capable and trustworthy to make our own decisions about our own body and our own health because this is healthcare. Abortion is healthcare. It is an access to a treatment for something that that woman wants to be able to make a choice in a safe manner. That's all this is. You can remove all of your thoughts and all of your beliefs and keep them in your, your own choices. But when you make choices for women, and these stories that we're hearing across the country, whether in Georgia, North Carolina, women that are actually having to become sicker and sicker and sicker before they're able to, to seek treatment, um, patients that are crossing state lines, patients that are putting them, themselves in risk, at risk. This is the United States. Like we, we, this should not be happening here. But that's when I tell you to pay attention because in the debate, uh, Donald Trump said, "Yeah, look it. I, 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 you know, Roe v. Wade. That was a great thing that I was able to do to turn over Roe v. Wade. So I just want to give it back to the states. Eh, give all those decisions back to the states. I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna touch this. Give it back to the states. Well, you cannot choose which state your pregnancy goes south in. You know, you're in a state where you think you have access to healthcare, and you go on a little road trip." these people have to understand how incredibly important it is to get out and vote and vote really about, you don't have to, I think, like you said in the beginning, when you go into the, into the, into the ballot to vote, I get very passionate about this. It makes me crazy. You know, we used to have straight party voting that does not exist in the state of Pennsylvania any longer. You cannot pull the ballot for all the Democrats or all the Republicans, but I think it's better in a sense that, you know, if you tr you want to believe in this person for president, but you really want this person for your state rep or this person, you're able to do that now, but do a little research about where they are on issues because these are the big ones. I mean, when I ran in 2019, we did a poll and 2% were two percent of people were concerned about abortion. 1% was pro-life, 1% was pro-choice. Everything else was economy. Um, you know, everything, there was other things on the ballot that were more important to them than, than abortion. But fast forward now, it's been overturned and we're watching these stories that are happening and we had a safety net. And I think a lot of people were comfortable with that, that 16 week viability number that we talk about. Um, and you know, when you talk about saying that a baby is, is and, the, and President Trump is saying this, like the ex-president is saying when you, there are states that when the baby is born, uh, you know what? We're we're not we're not going to keep this baby. That's called infanticide. That's murder. That is not happening in the United States, and it makes me crazy that this kind of information is being told by this man who tells so many lies. He he's he tell he's so dangerous. And I think that I'm I'm hopeful that people ask questions, get information, and don't be afraid to ask questions because that's the only way you're going to be able to dispel these these myths. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting, you said, you know, before abortion wasn't perhaps as big of an issue as it is now, but it's, and for me, it's like, I don't, I'm 53. I don't have children. I don't expect to get pregnant. So it's not for me that I'm voting. I'm vo well, I'm voting for all women, yes. but I mean, it's, it's not even for my ability to have that procedure. It's, it's, it's for the fact that quite frankly, for me, what I get infuriated that anyone would think they have the right to tell me what I can do with my body. I'm like, can we regulate when men, uh, what, when they're taking care of themselves, where those things go, they're going, it's like, Oh no, you're putting babies down the drain. I mean, like, can we regulate their bodies? We would, the, the city would be burning if anything like that. Ever happened. Absolutely. And yet we're <laughs> sitting here like, you can tell us what we can do with our bodies. I find that infuriating. Yeah. So that alone is yeah. why I'm voting. But I mean, for the future generations, I mean, my God, as you mentioned, like depending on, I, I never thought of it from that perspective, you take a vacation, right? And suddenly maybe you're starting to have a miscarriage or something yeah. and you're in a, the wrong state. 
you could good luck. Ble- you could bleed out good and luck. die. Yeah. Good luck. And they're gonna come for other things. You, this is number one. You 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 have all these people that are protected under LGBTQ rights, about housing, about racial issues. I mean, they're coming. This is just a little tip. I mean, I did not read the the uh, that 2025 plan. It's 900 pages, but I know I I know about it, and I read the topics that they want to address. And he's stepping away from it, but it is the playbook. It's the playbook, and it's really. Um, it's really frightening. And when I talk about it's abortion, it is abortion, but it's also it's also access to birth control. It's also the right to be able to plan your family. It's also about access to IVF. I mean, abortion is a, is something that is a treatment. I mean, a miscarriage or an ectopic pregnancy is not something that 90% of women don't want to have that ectopic pregnancy. They don't want to have that miscarriage. It is devastating. They are they are incredibly consumed with devastation, but the treatment for it is abortion so that they can have another pregnancy healthy and you don't get septic or have any tissue left over so you don't get sick. So it's the safest way to to treat the ectopic and or the miscarriage, elective or spontaneous, that's abortion. Um, it, but we have made it like this ugly, dirty, murderous thing that is, that is that's, it's healthcare and it should be something that is accessible safely for women. Period. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And you mentioned, you know, uh, birth control. Well, with what the Comstock law that I believe that's not just, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I've, I've heard people like Mitch McConnell or somebody talking about that and supporting that. And based on that, you couldn't get uh, yep. I think it was, you know, certain prescriptions or the uh, the day after pill or anything yep. like that. So they're, they they want to make that illegal as well. I have a member here in the house that we we, we could not even deliver telemedicine telemedicine, which is essential for mental health. Telemedicine is a way that we can charge your insurance, but deliver mental health to patients that need it most and feel more comfortable in their home, being able to speak to their doctor. Because, but I have a wingnut of a woman that I serve with who wouldn't, would not let that bill come out of her committee because one of the drugs that they were able to, to prescribe over this telemedicine was the morning after pill. And the whole thing went off the rails. And she really did affect many people in rural areas that really need to access, whether it be mental health care or just a family doc. So, you know, these one issue things that just tear everything off the rails and it does affect many, many people. I'm hoping that everybody, when they when they go to vote, they really think, even though they might be, you know, a Republican or a Democrat, whatever party you are, I, I want them to really think about those, those down ballot things that really are going to matter. Yeah. I, this question, and you don't have to answer it. We can move on. You can wave it, but I guess I, I, what confuses me when I drive through Lackawanna County and I see a lot in old forge, I see a ton in uh mid Valley, a lot of Trump signs and a lot of the Trump flags and that I don't, I guess I don't understand. Like I can respect, I have two cousins who are uh, rich, white, older males yeah. who yeah. vote for Trump. Yeah. And I can understand why in a sense they're protecting their pocketbook, right? They're, yeah. you know, their tax, uh, how they're taxed. But the folks who see this person as like a, a hero, a folk hero, uh, you know, and their homes are, believe me, not the best. I don't quite see what they believe he's going to do for them. And I don't think any politician on either side, Republican or Democrat, should ever be held up in the fashion that this man is being held up. That's that's heading toward yeah. dictator uh, yeah. territory. It's a little scary. I don't know. Yeah. I don't quite understand yeah. what's happened, if there's something in the water or what. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's just his messaging. And when you talk about those that support him that are in that 1%, I get it. Their taxes, their money, they have a lot. And he has a plan for them. But I think the people that you and I are looking at around our area that just, they have like, look like they have pretty sad lives. They work really hard. They they don't have two nickels to rub together. And they're supporting this in this billionaire narcissist. I think it comes down to things like messages, he says, you know, the bad people are coming in across the border. They're taking all our jobs. They're killing our women. They're bringing the drugs. You know, I think it comes to, you know, those kind of topics. Um, You know, uh, let's not we're not going to let people get sex changes in the jails and I'm not going to let boys and girls share the same bathrooms. And it's those topics that I feel like people are hateful about and they don't want to support. And he's the ma- he's the deliverer of that part. Because look at Kamala Harris is saying all kinds of stuff that she can do. She can't do anything without a Congress that's going to let her do that. So her message can be all kinds of stuff about giving small businesses monies and doing all this kind of stuff. She needs a Congress to work with her. So when you're running for these big offices and you're saying all these plans, 
I want people to remember, okay, this is great. And I want, I want a lot of this stuff to work, but you also need a Congress and a Senate that will work with you and pass these laws and pass these bills. And sometimes that's just not going to happen. But I think getting back to your point, because I believe me, I'm fascinated with it too. I'm thinking, how could you be so supportive of this man that is, he doesn't care about you? He has never, he, he doesn't live in a, in, in walk in shoes that you, you and I, you know, work have, you know, like real struggles. Like he doesn't, this isn't his life. So he doesn't really want to, to help you. He doesn't understand your, your issues. He doesn't care. I mean, he wants to strip the whole affordable care act. I had conversations with people that truly believe the affordable care act and the Obama plan are different things because they don't like Obama, but they're on the affordable care act. And, they have, and I will ask them these questions and I know exactly, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get them in the end because I'm telling them this is what you have and this is what you have. That's the Affordable Care Act. I said, no, that is the Obama care plan. But they they have hate in their heart for certain populations, certain people. And you know when they figure it out, like you have insurance and you have access to ins insulin now that costs this much and coverage for this and preventative care because you have the Affordable Care Act, they don't like to hear this from President Obama. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah. That's unfortunate. Uh, yeah. Probably the same people who won't drive on Biden Express. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, did, you hear that today? did you did you hear that story? I didn't, but I, <laughs> I, I can imagine. But I know I've heard people who will say things to that nature. Well, no, my, uh, <laughs> my husband called me today and he said uh, the, he's at Scranton today and uh, Trump is coming to visit Scranton. And I guess when he got off the airplane, he didn't want to go down. So he has causing all kinds of chaos and the state police have to take him through South Side and West Side and North Scranton to get over to the riverfront, which I think is hysterical. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's I did not hear it exactly, but I was getting a mammogram this morning uh, at over at Geisinger and yeah. they were talking about that was the buzz about traffic. And I heard one woman say jokingly, well, he probably doesn't want to come he down did. Biden. She and I right. said, I could imagine that that would be it, because can you imagine if he did that? That would have that would oh. show a little humility. That I don't think he can <laughs> he manage. Can't do that. But, no, I'm glad you got your mammogram. I have my um, it's October's breast cancer because I have mine scheduled this month, too. So I think they get busy in October. Yes, they do. Well, and let me say, and this is not to get off topic, but it is kind of on topic in a way about protecting healthcare and, and how what the shortage is. I had called a couple months ago, I would have had to wait till December 18th. Yeah. Uh, and that's the case in all kinds of appointments, we know that you have quite a wait. And I said, well, put me on that list where in case you get a cancellation. And right. I was thrilled. I was fortunate mm -hmm. that they were able to bump me up earlier in October. Yeah. So I was happy. No, it's that. a shortage. Right. It's it's a problem. Yes. Yeah, it is. Uh, so as we wind down here, what is it that you would really want to leave people with from this conversation, whether it's about politics in general, the election? What would really be a message maybe that you didn't touch upon enough that you really want to uh, make people understand? Um, I think the most important thing is I think to, to be informed, you know, ask questions, listen to shows like you have. I mean, I listen to podcasts and I, you know, I read, I try because um, I think that's the best way. Ask questions. Um, I think that's the best way to keep um, the, your, the facts straight, you know, real, the facts, <laughs> just absorbing that and listening to people asking questions. Don't be afraid. Um, but I think I'm hoping that people are um, become more involved. Certainly, the most important thing is to go out and exercise your right to vote. It's, you know, we fought a long time for that. And I, I think it's an important thing. And I don't like to hear people say, well, I don't like either the candidates. I'm not going to vote. Um, or they have it in the bag. I'm not going to go vote for them. So I, I, I hope people, um, A, really remember how important it is to go out and vote. B, ask questions, get involved, go to a, go to, go to one of the hearings, go to the county commissioner hearing, go to the council, go, you know, see who your local school board people are and just, Kind of listen, but I am grateful for people like you that actually reach out, interview, talk to people, share it, because this is the way it's an easy way. It's hard for, for, for me to talk to, you know, lots of, you know, every week, lots, but something like you, what you're doing today and asking questions, getting a, a diverse um, group of guests. Um, listening to your guests and saying, hey, you know what, I think you should have this person on. I think you should have this person on and know that there are really good people in government. I serve with true servant leaders, people that truly are, um, they are uh, wanting to make a difference. And I am, I, I get to serve with some really good people in Lackawanna County that I just want pe folks to know that there are good people in government because I know that sometimes you get a politicians get a yucky name and you know we highlight the ones that are doing bad stuff but uh, we are really lucky in Lackawanna County both but you know, we've got two great three great county commissioners one Republican two um, Democrats 
Chris Shermack and I are dear friends. He is a wonderful, transparent um, a guy that I, is accessible. And then we've got our two um, Democratic ones. So just know that there's, there is bipartisanship. There are good people in government. Ask questions and um, you know have faith because I think it's going to get better. I think it's going to get better. I think we have to, we have to do better for our two populations, our the babies and the younger people that are coming up in this world. They're they're kind of traumatized by stuff that you and I didn't have to deal with, like school shootings and terrible storms and the internet and the cell phones and the COVID. I mean, my kids are like have a weird youth. They had a weird youth because of those things. And then I want people to remember. The, um, the elderly that went before us and all the sacrifices they made for us and they should not be dismissed. So those yeah. are my group of people that, you know, you and I are on our own, Janine. We got to figure it out. I was going to say that the hell with my group. I, we, what the hell am I? I'll figure it we, out because we have to. <laughs> we got to figure it out. I call us the sandwich. We're in the middle. We got to take care of the other the other peeps. But yeah, yeah. we're we're on our own. We're, we, have, we have to. Uh, well, I'm trying to take care of the elderly now so that when we get there, somebody will help take care of us. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. Set by example there. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I want to follow up to what you said about, um, cause I I'm a re registered Democrat. That's how my family, you know, that's how I was raised. Although I am someone I'll admit, I, I kind of find myself coming a little more center for a lot of things and mm -hmm. would vote Republican in different ways if I believed in the person or yes. what they were saying. And to your point about the commissioners, uh, you know, Chris Shermack, I will say I've seen him out and about at everything he and I, everything. I appreciate that so i know because i i've talked about this with some other democrat friends oh well he blah 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 i say you know what i can tell you is of all the commissioners honestly over the past several years he's the only one i've seen at multiple events and he doesn't just come get a picture he hangs out he talks yeah. to people and mm -hmm. i have great respect for that I yeah. Do. yeah yeah that's what those are the hard things to do because you're walking into these rooms and you can get you know into a group that's gonna go at it with you and i think they usually walk away thinking all right we do not agree, but I like this person and I could call him and her or her. And I could say, look at, let's, we got to get to it. We got to get to a compromise here because this is a disaster. And that's the kind of person that I think um, the, the commissioners are. And certainly with Chris. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, not to go too far off topic too, but like we say, I've heard other friends say years ago when they voted for Trump, oh, I'm not voting for the man I'm voting for his policies or whatever. But I think, I, I don't really buy that, to be honest, because I think we are always getting the person regardless. I mean, granted, they're not responsible for everything because even as you said, you know, Kamala Harris can't do anything without the support of the Congress and everything right. else, but you're still getting a person. Yeah. Uh, and if you like the person, regardless of their party, then I think that means a lot. And yeah. if you don't, if a person is, <laughs> for example, Trump, I yeah. don't like that person. And that's why for me, I find so much about him so repugnant that I couldn't uh, give my vote. So no, I he, think we do have to look at the person a little yeah, bit. Yeah, he ain't going to change. He's not going to change. She yeah. actually has some really wonderful qualities and, and real life experiences that um, are very enduring. And she has empathy and she has she gets it. He doesn't. There are, and I can't believe it. There are so many better candidates that they could have chosen on the Republican side that are pragmatic people that are smart and is full of wisdom and, you know, reasonable. And he, I, I know lots of Republicans that are just horrified that this person is their their leader of their party. Um, so I think hopefully, but but again, it's tight. I mean, you 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 and I are where we live. There's signs all over the place for both. So I don't know what's good. And Pennsylvania is the swingiest of swing states. I know it, it, she leads the country, but Pennsylvania is the one that's going to choose the president. Just you, we got to, we got to make sure this vote, this state votes the right way. That's a lot of pressure. Pennsylvania we got Get a lot of pressure. out there. Yeah. <laughs> <Get> out there. <laughs> <laughs> that is so true. All right. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time today, Bridget. And, uh, you know, I'm glad that you're in the position you're in. And I, I feel strong and positive as a woman that you're there, that you're looking out for us. Uh, so I, and I'm grateful that you had the time today to, to talk with me. Well, thank you for having me on the show anytime. And I hope you, I hope you, I, I see you in North Scranton. <laughs> oh yeah. I'm, I'm here. I'm around. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jeannie. It was really nice to meet you and have, yeah, have the show today. Absolutely. Thank you so right. much. And okay. to my listeners, I say, thank you as always. Uh, 
be watching for the next couple of weeks. We've got the end of October, so we've got some fun coming up. I'm going to have a fun, fun Halloween-ish themed couple of shows. And then, you know, just stay tuned because every week, you know, it's another fabulous woman who I hope you will learn some information from inspiration and entertainment as always. So check out the show notes as always for information if you would like to help support this content and sponsor this podcast. But remember, you can always help by sharing this podcast so that other people can hear and learn from these great women that I have here every week sharing their stories. So as I always say, every week, I appreciate you from the bottom of my heart and the bottom of my wine glass. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.